childish behavior. Oh, each cloud contains pennies from heaven. So, any so let's from find out how no, valuable I... is it? <laughs> All right, here we go in three, two, one. You are live. Hello, 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 Santa Barbara. It's your Chantress of Everything Valuable and Beautiful, Elizabeth Stewart. And, you know, Saturday I went to a, a function at the Natural History Museum and I ran into Luke Swetland, who's the uh, director there. And he said, I loved your program on the Santa Barbara Astrology Unit. And how oh, fast... Oh, 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 you used the bad word. Astronomy. Yes. Oh, I said astrology? Yep. <laughs> yes, you did. You almost got shot out of a cannon. <laughs> okay. Okay. The Santa Barbara... In fact, I think I even said that to Luke and he said the same thing. Don't <laughs> mention that word. Anyway, the Santa Barbara Astronomy Unit... And he loved it. And he said, how fast can you do a, a, a follow-up interview? And uh, he took me to take a look at the uh, Hubble photos. Webb, I mean, James Webb. James Webb, that's right. James Webb photos. And I said, oh, you know, we got to get uh, some of the guy, guys to talk about the James Webb uh, phenomena. Um, and he said, yeah, absolutely. Ha have them on again. So I got in touch with Chuck McPartland. He's a retired radar system software expert. He is a coordinator for the Santa Barbara Astro Astronomy Unit, and he does the outreach events. And he's a volunteer planetarium presenter at our um, our museum. And I thought, well, who better to talk to us about the web images over at the Natural History Museum? And first of all, Richard and I tried to do a program about the imagery from the web because I had looked at it, Chuck, from the standpoint, and other people had as well, in my in my background, looked at it from the art background. Uh -huh. I want you to know it was so effective on radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. No, it, no, we were talking about various wavelengths and color, if you remember, Richard, and and uh, and the effects of um, of these wavelengths on color and the choices of the scientists to render the colors in a certain way. And of course there's color theory, Chuck, that goes back to um, a scholar at the Bauhaus, James Eiten, the Swiss scholar. And he studied the effects of color in general and the color wheel. Um, and, you know, he had some definite theories about primary versus secondary colors and then the influence, you know, on um, on people themselves. Uh, and then, you know, um, another great scholar of this was Ellsworth Kelly, who was a painter, but he came from a scientific background. And he put, okay, so here's the color wheel, right? It's a wheel. Green is opposite red, etc. And he put green and red together where the borderline of the green and red where it was almost electric to look at. Um, and so Richard and I were talking about the uh, James Webb imagery as very artistic. And we wondered if there was somebody, um, was it, is it in, in Pasadena, where, wherever the, 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 the photos were being touched, we wondered if there was somebody behind the, the color selections and how they were selected. Can you tell us? They have multiple palettes that they use, um, depending on what they want to emphasize. So I'm sure the like the near cam folks have a set and the, the mid infrared cam MIDI guys have a, have a set. And they have scientific sets that are quite often just based on shifting the wavelengths that you can't see into the visible spectrum. You know, so the, the longer wavelength infrared shows up as more red and the shorter wavelength infrared shows up as more blue. When you say shows up, but it's not really showing up, is it? Well, if, if they showed you a, an image in infrared, you wouldn't see it. We can't see infrared. You would see nothing. Yeah. So right, they have to I shift mean. it over into the visible spectrum. And so they just do a straight, you know, a straight, probably linear shift over, although they may, they may vary that depending on people's color response. And then they, that's their scientific, sort of their scientific palette, but they have an artistic palette where they, where they try to make things, they probably have several artistic palettes where they try to make things look uh, visually pleasing. 
So it just depends on who's processing the image and what 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 the purpose of the image is. If they're if they're going to study the image, it probably looks a lot different than what they release to the public because they want it to be pretty pictures that people will really like. And do you know if there are, you know, uh, people, worldwide, one of the most favorite colors is blue. Mm -hmm. You know, do you know if they, if they're affected by, say, the actual claim that certain colors make us quote unquote, see red, feel blue? Um, yeah, there's, there's definitely psychological effects that people have <clears throat> with colors, like, you know, coloring rooms to calm people down in, yeah in waiting rooms or in hospitals and things like that. I don't know how much concern that would be for the web people. Um, well, if you're talking about, you know, having the public be aware of the glories of the program, you'd want to make the, um, the choices as, you know, as pleasing yes. as possible. Yes. That would be their artistic palette. Yeah. So they've, they've, they've got some criteria they use for that. Okay. So, so tell me more about how how these photos come to be. I, I, obviously, last time we talked, you know, you have actively been showing people how to take photos from your telescope. And Not how so is much me as as Jerry? Uh, he's he's really the imaging expert. Um, but yeah, you know, even the even the sensors that we use with our cameras have different spectral response than your eye has. So when, when you're making an astrophoto, you too are, are making some choices along that aesthetic um, realm there of, of what, what colors you assign to stuff and how, how saturated you make them and things like that. So amateur astronomers do the same thing, just probably more on an emotional basis uh, than, than the uh, strictly scientific basis that, that Webb would use to get scientific data out of, out of the, the images. And what are what are the images being used for? I know it's public relations on one level, but what what else? Oh well, I mean, the reason they they makes them redder. So when you want to look back in time, you have to look at redder and redder wavelengths. And now they're pushed all the way into this mid infrared band to look back almost to the beginning of time, to the, to the very edge of the Big Bang. And what they're looking for with that is the very first stars and galaxies that, that formed in the universe, because they are now shifted into those wavelengths by the expansion of space as they travel through it. Okay, give me a little bit um, less academic explanation. Sure. So, so there, there's the Big Bang, and now we have this expansion of the universe, uh -huh. and the the, the web is looking at the edge of that expansion, yes. which is in the mid infrared range. Well, yeah, it's actually, you can see this, the surface of the fireball of the Big Bang in microwave frequencies. That's the cosmic microwave background. But they want to look back and see stars, the first stars that formed in the first galaxies. So that's, that's pushing into this infrared range. And they're, they're out in this, what they call mid infrared, um, looking at these very first stars and galaxies. And, you... and, the, and the, what, what kind of information they're getting from that is they have great spectral resolution so they can now take that light that they see and spread it out into a wide rainbow and look at what parts are brighter and darker and see what elements are there and, and what's going on. So in addition to looking way far back in time, they can also look at these exoplanets we're finding around other stars and they can measure elements in their atmospheres with this spectral resolution. So there's there's multiple things they're using the web for, but the main one was to look way, way back in time. Is there any other endeavor, human experience, et cetera, in which we are able to look back in time? Well, anything you see is back in time by about a billionth of a second per foot. I think that's it, true. <laughs> it takes time for the light to get to you. So, um, you know, in history and antiques, that's looking back in time in some respect. So, um, but it's not. It's looking back in time, but it's not. It's 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 interpreted through modern, or sorry, I should say, contemporary um, 
perspectives. So, I mean, that's a really good comment, interesting comment to someone like me, because, for example, there's certain eras, if you take antique furniture or art, for example, there's certain eras that are just and and considered a horribly ugly today. Uh-huh. And and so and at the time they were, you know, uh, I'm thinking of maybe the the late 19th, early 20th century. That is, is a period that no one really wants um, and, and won't collect. Um, and so, you know, we're looking back in, in time in a way, but it's it's we're judging based on our own current ideas of aesthetics. So it's it's different because what the Web is doing is looking back in time. And you're you're looking at evidence, which at that evidence has been around in the form of elements since the Big Bang, right? Am I right? Well, the Big Bang um, ended up in a, in an early universe that had nothing but hydrogen and helium and a little bit of lithium and beryllium. So those were the only elements that were there, and only traces of lithium and beryllium. So it takes stars to manufacture the heavier elements. Um, so we're made out of star barf. We we're you know, all, you know, carbon and, and iron and oxygen are all products of star formation, but then stars explode or puff off their, their elements and they, it gets recycled. So they're looking back in time at these different eras, like you're talking about eras of, of furniture, different eras of, of star formation. You know, the earlier stars could be much larger because they were less opaque because they had fewer of these heavier elements in them. And then they would live really fast and die really young and spread out the elements. And so they're looking at how, how the universe evolved, basically. Okay, when we get back from the break, I want to ask you, your background is in radar systems. Well, really just computer software, but... Okay, uh, so I want to know if what you did resembled anything like what the web scientists are doing now. Not really. Not really. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering how radar differs. Well, radar is a different wavelength of light. Simply put. Yeah. Yeah. And they are looking at what what, what wavelength? This infrared? Infrared is um, higher frequency than radar, usually. Radar is out there in microwave and longer frequencies, in radio, if essentially, too. Interesting. Okay, so yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to know more about this idea of how they how they take a picture like that. What kind of gear is required? Let's talk about that when we get back from the break. Hey, Richard. Yes, indeed, Elizabeth. Okay, and I would love it, Richard, if you would offer some of your insights. Um, I did you hear Chuck telling us that that some of these stars lived fast and died young and we're composed of their material that's right only um, the di- only the good die young uh, <laughs> but yes i heard every word of what chuck said as a matter of fact the nsa heard every word that chuck said <laughs> and yeah, right. a fact check <laughs> no i mean isn't that fascinating that that's that yeah. we that we are star what did he say star bark star barf Oh, star barf, B A R F. Ah, we're even. <laughs> I'm used to talking to school star kids. Uh, you, you, I disavow any knowledge of that. <laughs> well, it might be true. In yeah. fact, it is maybe. All right, let's let's uh, go to quick break, and we get back from the break. I'm talking with Chuck McPartland. He's actually um, the volunteer planetarium presenter at Santa Barbara Natural History Museum and the outreach coordinator for Santa Barbara Astronomy Unit. And I have come to discover this club through Luke Swetland, who's the director of the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum. And I said, Luke, you know, what is, what's really the the coolest happening at the museum? Uh, And he mentioned, of course, the James Webb photos and asked if I would speak to uh, this uh, Santa Barbara Astronomy Unit. And I just found these guys so interesting. Uh, and it's a it's a thriving club, national club that's based here in Santa Barbara. And you might have seen them um, during the eclipse lately out there by. Um, uh, what was it? The, the, the is it four, five points you guys were at? Camino Real Marketplace. Camino Real, where they had 2000 people and they brought their telescopes and uh, 
very cautiously instructed people how to how to look at an eclipse. Uh, so it's a thriving club. I mean, 2,000 people showed up. Uh, so don't turn that down back with Chuck McPartland in a few minutes. Okay, and you are clear or moderately opaque. <laughs> Depending on your content of heavy elements. Uh, this is true. Uh, your content of heavy elements, I don't know, like lead. <laughs> well, to astronomers, anything other than hydrogen and helium is called a metal. And uh, why are not hydrogen and helium called a metal? Is it because they're called uh, gas and need Pepto-Bismol? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> oh, it's a commercial break. Natural history, yeah. You think that was okay? Oh, yeah. I mean, to tell you the truth, he was somewhat ambiguous when he answered me when I said, you know, will you be able to come on the radio show? He said something like, well, I wouldn't contribute much. I'd just be saying they're pretty pictures. Huh? So I assumed he was coming, but... Well, I, uh, I, uh, as we were looking at the pictures, I, I was actually saying something much more different, like, wow, that is yeah. cool. <laughs> Ever so descriptive, huh? Yeah, they really are. And, you know, one thing you were talking about, uh, the images on the radio, they've been sonified. So oh, that's right. I, 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 Dr. Sky and I actually, uh, talked about the sounds of some of the images from James Webb, which I, I'm going, you're kidding, really? Yeah, and they did a similar thing. They chose a palette of tones for the various, you know, concentrations of pixels and, and data values in the, in the arrays of data that they collected. And they, you know, they gave away for people who can't see to uh, perceive the events, perceive the uh, images. Richard, do you have a clip of that you can find? Mr. Dugan. Oh, he must he must be on the phone. I wonder if he can he can find that. Um and we can play a little of that. That's I didn't know that. That's very cool. And of course, Richard for years knew the Baron. You know, they worked together. All right, we're coming back now. We're coming back now. We're coming back. Oh, I'm sorry, I got in caught in a loop there. <laughs> Three, two, one, you're live. So, Richard, can you find a clip of that the sound that the the um the the, the images make? Uh, I yes, I will look for one here real quick. So, uh, just okay. give me a couple minutes here. A and you are live. You know, we're live on the air, and I will look for some of those clips. So, go right ahead, uh, you and uh, Chuck McFarland. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart, and we're talking with the. Uh, former president and outreach chair for the Santa Barbara Astronomy Unit, Chuck McPartland. And Chuck is talking to us about the exhibit that's up at the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum, the James Webb photos. And we were talking about the idea that it's the, the, the spectrum uh, of the palette. So if you have this linear spectrum of frequencies, and infrared um, and medium infrared, et cetera, is at one end. What the uh, um, scientists have done is just shifted that to the range that we can see in a linear way. That would be one palette that they use to colorize. And then the other palette they use to colorize, 
Chuck is saying an artistic palette that actually has is taken into consideration some of the um, psychic impressions of color that human beings go through. For example, I gave you the the um, the, the word seeing red and feeling blue and this sort of thing. Um, so, and another thing they'll do is sometimes they'll just um, alter that quite a bit to show boundaries between different things, you know, to emphasize things that are scientifically important. Like what? Give me an example. Well, if they want to, if they really want to show um, jets coming out of uh, young stars, Tari type stars that have these jets coming out, they might apply a different color to the bow shock that's coming out of these jets to emphasize where those objects are in an image because they're looking at star formation in these clouds of gas and dust. And what is a jet? A jet is where, okay, you, you, you have this rotating spherical body that's forming a star and, and stuff is falling into it, but it um, as it falls in, it heats up. As a gravitation collapses, it heats up and that causes uh, that can cause radiation that drives away material. So it can't swallow it all at once. Plus it's charged particles, so you get these magnetic fields and they can get all twisted up and result in the equivalent of magnetic tornadoes along the rotational axis where stuff can get shot out. Charged particles get shot out in a jet, which is like a beam coming from a laser or from a, from a flashlight. It's usually more collimated though, so more like a laser beam coming out. And then that, that material is traveling at high speed and it, it uh, collides with some of the material around it and causes what are called bow shocks, which can also radiate in different wavelengths as they heat up. So they're 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 colorizing to see where the beginning of those isn't it wouldn't it be at the surface of the sphere or is it sometimes deeper? Well, the, these early these young stars have those jets and those jets cause these bow shocks and if they emphasize the bow shocks then they can more easily find where these young stars are in the in the clouds of gas and dust. I see. So it's not necessarily like we see a round orb. And right. they, they could still be enshrouded in gas and dust and you can't see them, but the shocks can break through that shroud and then impact uh, other material that's out there. And so it helps you find these young stars. Hey, it, wonderful. And so what's the gear like? So what's the, how is the web configured? Is it, it's both stationary and mobile, right? It's, it's uh, fairly stationary in this Lagrangian point, the L2 Lagrange point that's about a million miles out where the gravitational effects of the earth and the moon and the sun kind of cancel out. And so it, it travels in its orbit around the sun at the same rate we do. So it always stays kind of in the same place, but it, it, it's actually in a, in a small orbit around the center of that spot. And uh, it like it's a got spaceship? a huge sun shield that's pointed toward the sun continuously because it wants to be cold. It wants to be low noise and wants to look at infrared. And they can train it a little bit. They can point the, um, the telescope with, within a fairly limited range. But because they're orbiting around the sun, they can point it anywhere in the sky at some point in the year. The mirrors are beryllium metal, which is highly toxic to, to deal with. But it's thermally stable. And so it doesn't change shape with temperature changes. So that means the mirror is very stable. It's coated with gold because gold uh, is a better reflector of infrared wavelengths uh, than say, you know, the normal silver or aluminum mirrors that you would have here in an amateur telescope to look at visible light. Uh, and then they have these cool detectors. They have liquid helium uh, on board to cool the detectors down to very low temperatures to to minimize the thermal noise that they would get in the images. Hmm. Now, I have found something. I hope this is uh, what we are looking for. Uh, these are the sounds from uh, the James Webb Telescope. I don't know when they were recorded, but by the same token, I have no clue as to when these sounds were originally made. Billions well, of years ago, but well, here you no, go. No, no, no. The, the, what they do is they take the they take the visual wavelengths or the infrared wavelengths, and they just assign tones to them. So these sounds are just totally artificial, mm -hmm. but they're a different way of looking at the data for people who are visually impaired, or some people actually can process audio, complex audio, better than they can visual. 
Um, so it's it's another way of looking at the data. Okay. Well, uh, here you go. See, there was a nice little screech of data at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and this is a, it runs about 60 seconds. I considered maybe using this as a little background music for somebody's commercial. Yeah. Is that the um, cliffs, the cosmic cliffs image, or is it the, uh, the uh, ring nebula image? Uh, let me see what it shows me here. That's not, it, that's not specified. Southern ring nebula. Okay, it's southern ring nebula. Okay. As opposed to the northern ring nebula, yes, or the northern rectangular or tri triangular nebula. By the way, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I'm surprised that we only got 60 seconds, uh, but there you go. Um, 60 seconds of the sound bite? No, it's yeah. only yeah, it's it's only a 60 second sound bite from the web from the internet that web uh but then of course they have like seven hours of pictures from the web with relaxing music <laughs> that's a little different <laughs> yes it is yes it is uh, this you know is a... go ahead go ahead elizabeth I, I was gonna say what is really interesting about that little clip is because is that that the, it's using the western full tone and half tone un understanding of music um it's that's you know we have half tones quarter tones full tones and it's using our system a western space system uh but of course that's that, probably that would, the bias of whatever scientist you know yeah uh, researcher produced it yeah yeah and so when somebody like you Chuck, listens to that and you know it's the um what did richard tell us it was describing the what southern ring the, nebula southern it's a whole nebula so how big is a nebula oh, nebulae, <laughs> nebulae come in all different sizes um they can be tens of light years across in this case the southern ring is probably only on the order of a light year across so only like six trillion miles <laughs> um, it's it's one of the smaller nebulae i mean it's uh it's the end stage in life of a low mass star like our sun where it kind of barfs off its outer layers and the core collapses to form a white dwarf and it gives off ultraviolet light and makes the gas fluoresce so ooh okay. fluoresce yeah so all right so this is the southern the southern nebula at nebula and when you listen to those sounds do you understand what they are implying well from seeing and hearing previous ones in the planetarium we have some of these sonifications and you can put up the web images and and play it and you can see a line go scanning across the image uh, which shows the line of data that they're interpreting with the sound and um, that those sounds that's uh boy i'm not too musically inclined so i don't know how to describe some of the sounds but the ones that sounded like a a sharp pluck uh, uh of a tone yeah. from from a yeah. string those are how they usually sonify the stars and then the intensity of that is the is the brightness of the star and then they scan across the image. So there are there are background and foreground stars in the image, and those were the ding 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 things that you heard going across. And then the rest is is the gas concentration. Mm. Yeah. And, well, we, we know what that sound is here on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, let's go to quick break. I want to yeah. know what what because um, Chuck McPartland is a volunteer plan, planetarium presenter. And I have, I have to admit, I've never been to a show there. And I want to know what the shows are about and who attends them and what what the themes are, et cetera, et cetera, when we get back, what, what his role is as a, as a presenter at the planetarium, our own planetarium at the Santa yes. Barbara Natural History Museum. So when we get back from the break. I'd love for, love for Chuck to tell us what, what we can expect if we go to a show there. Okay. Richard, let's go to a quick break. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's intrigued that sound. Among November. Richard, 
Yes, indeed, you're clear. Okay. okay. Yeah, there's a new projector at the planetarium. It's really nice. Oh, you, you go tell us about that when we get back. You got it. Probably, but uh, I can I can tilt this. Well, you're gonna have to. All right. Were you were you uh, interested in in um, math and physics and science as a child, Chuck? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've often thought that if we could go back in time and see ourselves as 13 year olds, <laughs> we'd have a pretty good sense of what, what our direction would be, you know, as far as the, the, the maybe even career choices, but definitely advocate advocacy choices were hard. Or, uh, I remember when I was 13, I, um, I guess I decided that my walls in my bedroom weren't interesting enough, and I got a hold of all different color paints. I painted from the floor to the ceiling a flower garden, which uh -huh. didn't thrill my father very much. But, uh... <laughs> I can remember being in first grade and taking these tests where they were trying to do things like that, like what is your aptitude or what are you interested in? And I remember trying to skew it toward being a park ranger because I thought that would be really cool. And it came out <laughs> mathematician astronomer. And I'm like, oh, darn, that sounds boring. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> yeah. All right, we're yeah, coming uh, back you... in three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart. The pleasure of talking with Chuck McPartland, who is the volunteer planetarium presenter at the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum and also the um, former president of the Santa Barbara Astronomy Unit and coordinator for public outreach events now for the Santa Barbara Astronomy Unit. And just a, a quick word, we were talking about the exhibit that's up at the Museum of the James Webb Imagery and Chuck was trying to explain or was attempting to explain to me, which is, gosh, I'm not the most uh, mathematically gifted person in the world, uh, what these frequencies are, how they translate into both visuals and music. And Chuck mentioned that when he does his shows at the, at the planetarium, he actually shows the image and plays the music so that so he, when he's scanning the image, he can show why the music is doing what it's doing. And go, tell us what a show is, is all about, Chuck. What do you so, present? So I'm just one of, of, of multiple voluntary, you know, volunteer presenters there at the museum. Uh, it's a fairly small planetarium. It can hold about 40, 45 people in that neighborhood. And um, we, they just got these brand new high res projectors uh, that give a fantastic image of the sky with, with much better, um, especially uh, contrast levels than the older ones. So the sky is really dark black and um, it's capable of presenting uh, both the night sky and videos on the full dome. And uh, it's, we're not doing the James Webb show currently, but there was a James Webb show that we had that has these sonifications of the first releases from the James Webb, including the Cosmic Cliffs and that Southern Ring Nebula. And uh, so you could present the image up onto the sky and there would be a line showing, uh, as the data was scanned across the image, there would be a line that, that transitioned across the image. And then you would hear the sounds of the different um, objects that that line was passing across, like the, the depth of gas or the depth of dust or the uh, brightness of stars as it scanned across. Uh, currently, 
uh, there are some children's shows uh, early on in the, in the day, uh, you know, um, oh, they used to be called like Twinkle Twinkle for Little Dippers and, and things like that. And those are uh, early in the day, like at 11. And then at noon, um, there's a show uh, called Totality about total eclipses or eclipses in general. And, um, and that will probably transition to um, exploring the solar system where we go and look at the, at the solar system. And the, the special effects are great in the planetarium. You can go hover over Jupiter and watch it rotating beneath you and you know, visit, visit the planets and their moons or, or go outside the galaxy and look back at what our galaxy might look like. Um, then the uh, one o'clock show is exploring the autumn sky at this point. So we look at the constellations that are currently up and also visit the planets briefly, but just the planets that are currently up. So Jupiter and Saturn mainly, uh, and tell stories about the constellations. And then at two o'clock, there's a Spanish show um, that's a full dome video about the formation of the earth and, and the planets. And then at uh, three o'clock, there's the, the English version of that, uh, the formation of the, the birth of the solar system or the birth of the earth. And you so you've got these shows back to back. Are they fairly well attended? Oh, it varies all over the place. You know, if if it's Super Bowl Sunday, you get all the mothers and their kids, and uh, if it's Mother's Day, you get some um, you know dads with the kids. Um, it it varies all over the place depending on on whether astronomy's been in the news or what the weather's like. If everybody's at the beach, you know. I get it. I get it. And so are you, are you then, do you have pretty much free choice or is there a script as a presenter? Um, the shows I do uh, pretty much, I have free choice of what I'm saying and there's a, and depending on the theme of the show, then there's a, a screen that comes up on the controller that has these various buttons you can press to show different things that you cho may choose to emphasize on that subject. The formation of the Earth video is, is more like a canned show where there's a quick presentation of the current night sky and then a half an hour, you know, like 10 minutes of that, and then half an hour of this show uh, that's, that's pre-canned, that's uh, impressive video. You know, I wanted to ask you, when I was uh, in high school, college, et cetera, it was maybe a fad, I don't know, but I, I grew up in Chicago and our planetarium there- World famous. Yeah, we used to attend, and we were kids, you know, we used to attend, attend these shows, but it was like rock music. Yeah. What was that all about? That seemed to have been a fad where, where there would be rock music and like laser light flashing on the, on the, on the dome. And uh, we don't do that. It's more, we more present science. We did, we did have a period a couple of years ago where briefly, um, you know, we did a show and we didn't have an actual laser projector in the planetarium, I, I don't recall, but, but it was like a, a video that we would play on the dome where there was Beatles music and then these various Lisa Zhu type figures of the, um, of the lights. And um, some people really like that, um, but to us as presenters, it's like they're not learning anything really. You know, it's just entertainment in that, in that case. When you say laser, it, that, so so how is how does that differ? You said it, it wasn't really laser; it was a video. What's a laser image? Well, they, you can actually get um, boxes that have lasers in them that um, move the lasers and, uh, based on the tones that are being presented, and so they will do these figures that kind of oscillate with the music. But we didn't have the actual laser box. We had just video that was taking, taken of one of those, of a laser box presenting that. I get it. Okay, so the show that I saw as a teenager in Chicago with the rock music and the laser, the laser was dancing to the music more or less. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So it was more of it like a psychedelic experience kind yes, of thing. I exactly. think we were aiming at that, yeah. I remember it was like, it was a Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon or something like this. It was... Uh -huh. <laughs> Something like that. When so so, do you have? I remember being at um, a planetarium up. Front. I have a cabin in Lake Arrowhead, and there's a little planetarium um, 
in Lake, in Lake Airhead. Uh, of course, we're 5,500 feet up. There's a little tiny planetarium there. And I took my grandson um, and there was a, a woman who, uh, who presented who had also a PhD in physics and she was wonderful. And um, some of the young kids were just, what's a good word for it, gobsmacked. They uh -huh. just were so fascinated. And I can remember sitting in the audience and, and these you know, young, young children, boys and girls, both with their mouths open, you know, um, do you experience that? Do you, do you, when you're presenting to, 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 to school kids? I, you know, I don't do the school kid presentations. Those are done during the week. I just uh. do, I just do Sundays, but we do get children in there with families. And yeah, quite often we'll get people who are, who are very impressed by it and very interested in it. Mm -hmm. And some people are just, you know, they're there to, um, to have their kids be entertained for a few minutes while they get some shut eye. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you say that the, 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 you've got these new uh, projectors, uh -huh. how did you how did you acquire those? Um, well, that was, you know, that was the museum. They had a campaign to raise funds because it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to put these things in. Mm. They're from Evans and Sutherland in Utah, which do flight simulators, and they also do planetarium projectors of various levels uh, of um, expense and fidelity. And this is a fairly high fidelity for, for a small dome like ours, uh, new system. It's actually dual projectors, one on either side, instead of what we used, used to have was a single projector in the middle. And um, very, very, very well done. So uh, where do you find the images that you project? Well, the, the night sky images are just totally synthetic. They're just genned up in the computer as, as you tell it what time it is and where you are on the surface of the earth. So you can go anywhere. You can, you can hang out at the South Pole and, and you know, see what stars are there. Um, you can travel outside the galaxy and look back at it. Or you can load images that come from the web or from Hubble and have those displayed. So you, you have multiple choices for what you show, but a lot of it can just be computed and shown. And so who puts those shows together? Um, Chrissy Cook and, and John Winkowski, the, the current um, astronomy programs director, they kind of choose what the theme will be. Usually for mm. three months in a row, we do like seasons. Um, and it's usually the, one of them at least is the constellations of summer, constellations of spring, things like that. But Others are topical, like search for dark matter or eclipses, because there's there was the part the annular eclipse we just had and the total solar eclipse coming up in April. Ah, and what will you do for the total solar eclipse in April? Well, I'm sure they'll be showing this uh, this show again about eclipses, and we'll probably have another uh, public observation where we set up to look at it. It'll only be partial here, like forty percent, so not even as deep as this annular was. Uh, but it's still impressive. However, I must say, um, a total eclipse, experiencing the totality, is orders of magnitude more impressive than any partial phase, and everybody should experience one at some point in their life. So I want to talk about that. I want to talk about that. The total eclipse, and um, I don't know if I've ever experienced one. Um, oh, you'd know if you had. <laughs> okay, Richard. Let's go to a quick break. I want to talk about the total eclipse. I want to talk about what that's like. I know there's medieval, you know, tales of the world ending and this sort of thing. And, and it's a, it was a big deal in the in, in the ages when we didn't know why this eclipse was happening. Richard, let's go to a quick break. Hey, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> he's conversing well, with somebody but he did give you the one finger the, the good finger i guess right that's right what we had one minute okay um, well so, you know so, people used to think dragons were consuming the sun and things like that yeah, so. yeah right and and so there were there was imagery like that and then it would it go cold as well it does cool down uh birds go to sleep you know they roost in the trees cattle lie down um it's it's uh and just um, it's far beyond just the visual difference. It, it has an effect on you when you see it. It, it is just stunning. 
Uh, Richard, let's go to quick break. He's he's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think he's got us muted. Well, he's okay. So so cattle lie down, birds nest in the trees, and what do humans do? Uh, humans generally go ooh and ah quite a bit. Ah. <laughs> Because it is, it is a stunning experience. What happens though, Chuck? Well, the the of course the moon covers up the sun and everything goes dark. You can see stars again in the sky, and um, it looks like there's a hole in the sky, like like there's a this deep black hole in the sky. You get a little bit of ghostly light from the corona, which you don't normally see, the outer atmosphere of the sun, and it's got kind of a weird. I don't know. People describe it as electric quality. Um, of light and um it's just it's it's um very very weird and, and a total a total eclipse totally and uh, and where were you when you saw a total eclipse uh for 2017 we drove to wyoming and uh, uh -huh. we went to um casper wyoming and we were in a big parking lot around a an event center with four thousand other people in the parking lot so there was a lot of ooh and ah when when diamond ring effects and other things happen during during the eclipse that was the eclipse where the the they traveled all throughout the country in various places yes. received yeah okay i remember that and i i remember say thinking that there, it was the northern states like wyoming montana those it, it that, came across yeah uh washington oregon um wyoming and then um Illinois, I know across Illinois and then and down and out through South Carolina. There's a town in Illinois that uh, was in the path of totality for that eclipse. And they're going to be in the path of totality for the April eclipse coming up next year. And so they have actually renamed themselves temporarily Eclipse Town USA. And they like tripled their hotel rates. Where in Illinois? Uh Oh, I don't remember the real name of the town, but they call themselves Eclipse Town. I think it's kind of mid south uh, Illinois in there. Okay, okay, all right, Richard, and let's go. Richard, let's go to quick yes. break. Okay, let's go to quick quick break. We're talking with Chuck McPartland, who is the outreach uh, coordinator for the Santa Barbara Astronomy Unit. And I want to ask him when we get back from the we don't have a, a lot of time, but why the word unit is in their title. Uh, Rich, let's go to quick break. All right, you're clear. All right. <laughs> It's funny what I'm seeing with, with the, the the flag of, of screen in back of you. So I can see evidence that you're sitting in like a, a chair that's a little higher or a sofa or something. Yeah. Yeah. And it's got this, uh, you know, fake fur uh, blanket on it that the cat likes. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and so every so often I see the fake fur and then every so often I see the cat climbing on the back. Yes. Yeah. And he's. She's, you know, uh, she is, um, it's near snack time. So she's very friendly at the moment. Why can't I see her full frame, I wonder? She's black. Okay. And so the, um, the background interpreting software for Zoom kind of fades that stuff out and shows my background instead. Okay. That's why my shoulder sometimes partially goes away too, because I'm yeah. wearing a black t-shirt. I didn't know that about about Zoom that you shouldn't wear black. What well, it depends. It, it tries to pick like a, it tries to analyze the background and pick stuff that's static and 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 dark and eliminate it. <laughs> In the case, case of a black cat, that would yeah, that would be yeah. why I can't see her. Yeah. I mean, I can get rid of that flag background, but then you just see, you know, the china cabinet and the messy table behind <laughs> yeah, me. Right, that's right. <laughs> My refrigerator and yeah. dishwasher, right? Yeah. You know and what I, I said? Go ahead. I said to Luke, I said, you know, I just loved the, the astro astronomy unit and 
He said, he said, oh, it's a combination of geeks and nerds and geniuses. I said, I know. <laughs> so interesting. And Luke so is such a character himself. Oh, yeah. He's, he's great. We went we went to a little thing he had last night, and, and it was at the gallery where the, the web pictures are. So that was the first time we'd seen them put up in the gallery there. Our name is actually a bit of a pun, so I'll, I'll mention that. It's actually astronomical unit, and that's oh, part of the it? pun. Okay. All right, here we go. In three, you have three minutes. In three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart. I'm speaking with Chuck McPartland, who is the outreach coordinator and former president of the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. And I wanted to know the astronomical unit has a double entendre, does it not, yes. Chuck? Yes. An astronomical unit is the term astronomers use for the average distance between the Earth and the Sun which is about 93 million miles. And so uh, we named our club that and because we want to show cool stuff to 93 million people at some point. <laughs> it makes we're, a lot we're of up sense. to over 260,000 already. So we're, we're past the moon. 260,000 members. No, people that we've shown the sky to. Oh, really? Over the, over the last 20 years, yeah. Oh, okay. So you've shown, when you say shown the sky, you mean you've taken your telescopes out and shown people how to look through them? Yeah. Okay. How, how many people? You said two, 200,000? Oh, it was, yeah, it's over 250,000, somewhere in there, almost 260,000, I think. And what are you going to do for the April eclipse? For the April eclipse, I'm sure there'll be, you know, some, some special made planetarium shows. Uh, our, and that's the museum. And then our, our club will will have a public event somewhere uh, where, you know, a good public venue like the, the marketplace, uh, where we'll set up safely filtered telescopes uh, for people to view the eclipse. It's not, it, it'll be impressive, nowhere near as impressive as, as a total eclipse, but it'll be about 40% partial here. So um, you'll see a crescent sun. And um, a cool thing to do is to hold up a colander or something with multiple apertures like that, and you get multiple images of the uh, crescent in the shadow. So that's pretty fun. It acts like a multiple pinhole camera. Really? A, a colander? Okay, well, uh, I can't wait. I can't wait. That would be so cool to see you guys. Well, thank you, Chuck, for coming along. And just a little bit of a shout out. If, if you haven't been to our planetarium at the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum, you must go. We've heard from Chuck that there's Shows almost on the hour, and, uh, and we've just got a new um, present presentation system there for hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it's worth a visit for sure. And thank you, Chuck, for coming along and talking to us, talking to us about uh, Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit at Club. Thank you. All right, you are clear. <laughs> Thanks, Chuck. Well, thank you for bearing with us. Program, in Chuck. Yeah, thank you. I'll send you the link to this interview too, Chuck. Thank you. Okay. All right.